Would the Titanic still sink today? This is the University of the Netherlands. In 1912, probably the most famous ship in history set sail. At that point, it was famous for how big and beautiful it was. But today, it's notorious for how it sank. Mere days after the ship left for America, it hit an iceberg. The impact of the collision created six narrow openings in the bow of the ship, through which water entered and eventually caused the ship to sink. In this lecture, I will explain how things, especially steel, can break. And maybe with the knowledge that we have today, the Titanic would have been built to endure the collision. Let's start with the basics. To understand how things break, we need to understand three concepts we use in engineering. Strength, toughness, and ductility. We start with strength. Think about strength in terms of the amount of force something can take. What does that mean? For example, paper is less strong than steel because I can apply less force to it before it breaks and it tears. Then we normalize it, which means we divide it by the width and the thickness of the object. So the thicker and the wider something is, the more force it can take. We call the force divided by the width and thickness the stress. And the maximum stress something can take is the strength of the material. One material you might not expect to be strong is glass. But if we take a sheet of glass and pull on it, I won't be able to break it. But we all know that it shatters quite easily. That brings me to the second property, toughness. Toughness is the ability of a material to resist a crack. This can be a tiny crack that might not even be visible to the naked eye. One little crack one little scratch makes it become extremely weak. Just think of how a little chip in the car windshield can easily lead to an enormous crack. I can show you this in the material science and engineering lab at TU Delft. A glass cutter doesn't actually cut the glass, but it makes a notch in it, which is similar to a crack. When you score it, it's easy to pop and to break. The third property we need to see how something breaks is ductility. Ductility is how much something deforms before it breaks. Think of a strip of steel. It can bend quite a lot before it breaks. That's ductility. So we have strength, toughness, and ductility. They are separate ideas, but there is some linking between them. What is interesting is that you don't necessarily need a high score on all three of those to build a st strong structure. But ship designers typically demand all three of them in order to have maximum safety. To illustrate this, I would like to focus on some ships that were built sometime after the Titanic in the 1940s. These ships are, were called T2 tankers and they were used for oil transport during World War II. What was remarkable is that one of them broke in half while it was anchored in the harbor, not because of any impact. To understand what happened, we need to understand our concepts of strength, toughness, and ductility, and especially to see how they are influenced by temperature. Let's go back to our lab in Delft. With this machine, we test the toughness of materials, steel in this case. We have a small piece of steel here with a notch in the middle. The purpose of the notch is to simulate a crack. Remember how easy it was to break the glass once there was a notch in it? That's the principle that we're trying to test here. We test the first piece at room temperature and the second piece at liquid nitrogen temperature, which is minus 196 degrees. Okay, now we do room temperature. Wow, it's not even broken. It looks like it's uh, almost 320 joules. So the fracture surface is, is tortured and ductile. We repeat the experiment with one difference. We cool the second piece of steel with liquid nitrogen to a temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius. Yeah, this one's much more brittle. It's a flat surface here. And it looks like there was only eight joules absorbed in the impact. You can uh, 
just barely see through the fog and the, and the water vapor how flat it is. As you can see, we have two specimens that failed in very different ways. This one broke in a very even way, but not tough. This one broke in a very complicated way, but tough. They were made in the same shop at the same time from the same material, and the only difference was temperature. If we plot the amount of energy required to break this material with an impact, then you notice it has a very characteristic shape. You need little energy to break it at low temperature, and you need a lot of energy to break it at high temperatures. At low temperature, the steel is very brittle, and at high temperatures, it is more tough. This means it can resist cracks or notches in the structure. Now let's go back to the Titanic. We now know that when building the Titanic, the engineers didn't have the knowledge about toughness, the ability of steel to resist a crack, yet. On the night of the collision, they were navigating the North Atlantic Ocean. The cold temperature could have made the steel less tough, making it more prone to break. We can't tell for sure, but if the ship would have been able to take the impact by deforming instead of breaking, it would have helped a lot. The researchers have tested steel used for the Titanic with a machine like the one I demonstrated in the lab and compared it to a modern day steel. What we see here is that the Titanic steel transitions from the point at which it isn't tough to the temperature at which it is tough far above room temperature. So at room temperature, the steel wasn't tough and could easily break. This was very bad steel by today's standards. At the time, they didn't know better. Modern day steel is tougher and won't break so easily. The same goes for the T2 tankers, which were built a few decades after the Titanic. Next to that, the T2s were some of the first welded ships. When you weld something, you heat the material to the welding point. Then, when it cools down, it shrinks and it creates a lot of tension at the welding points. The tension and the choice of the wrong steel led to the breaking of the ships. The losses of many Navy ships, such as the T2 tankers in World War II, led to a lot of research that spanned decades after World War II. This led to rules in the 1950s for steel used in the future. This prevented newer models of the tankers and future Titanics from breaking or even splitting in half anymore. Today, we still use those rules based on those of the 1950s, and they seem to work pretty well. However, engineers now want to build bigger and stronger steel structures. They're starting to ask, do we need different rules? A current hot topic in engineering is the installation of offshore wind turbines. These offshore wind turbines are getting massive. Not only is the mass that supports them huge, but the nacelles, with the power where the power generation happens are also huge. These massive structures need to be installed. Can you imagine lifting that nacelle with that high in one lift? Then you're talking about some of the tallest cranes used in the open seas. So if you can use a stronger, thinner steel, you make the ship and the crane more stable. If you ask me whether the Titanic would still sink today, I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure. But maybe with the knowledge about how things, and especially steel breaks today, it might have been built to be more tough and deform before breaking. Since the 1940s, we've come a long way in understanding how structures break, the role of strength, toughness, and ductility play, especially at different temperatures. Now we want to understand it even better to create even stronger structures.